My biggest ambition is to understand how to tell stories with moving image um, uh, as well as possible. And that's probably, you know, I know you can be doing it for a thousand years and never really fully understand it, but at least you've got to try. Hi, I'm Jenny Cooney, film journalist and host of the podcast Aussies in Hollywood. I am excited to be presenting NFSA Presents Inspired conversations by some of our great Aussie talent in front of and behind the cameras about craft, talent, ambition, all of it. And I'm very, very excited that we have with us George Miller, who needs no introduction. Hi, George. Hi there. Hi, Jenny. So let's get right into it and start with your, your, first, uh, your first influential Aussie cinema memory. Well, I... I, I have to say, I don't know where I saw it. I'm not, I don't, I'm, I can't remember whether I saw it in the cinema or whether I saw it in, on television, but it was the movie Jeddah. I don't know if anyone remembers Jeddah, but it was a Charles Chevelle movie. Um, it, was, it was the first film shot in Technicolor in Australia around, in the 50s, around about 55. It was the first Indigenous Australian story brought to the world. Um, and it was so vivid. I mean, the landscape, I I know the Australian landscape was seen in um, in a lot of movies and black and white movies, but I, that's the thing I most remember. Um, it's still, it's contentious today because of the way it deals with the subject matter, which is a, a, an, an Indigenous uh, woman, Jeddah, who's who's brought into the white community, and there's attempt to have her assimilate, and yet she she's basically taken um, it back into the traditional community. It's it's a tragic story, but the memories are vivid. Are vivid, and and since then, you know, I I've. I've, I've got to know a little bit about the making of these films. These, these people who went out and made films in the early years, Australians, like everywhere else in the world, but in Australia, this film, they had to shoot it in the Northern Territory. They had to take the unexposed film in Cairns, and it was so hot up there, they had to put it either in caves or in Hessian bags and put the bags in the river and the film would have to be flown all the way to London, which was the only lab that could process the film. So they were shooting the film without video split, without rushes or dailies, and, and they only saw it months after they, they finished shooting. And they, they, were, they were really, they were amazing. They got such great results. And that's always, that's always been something that's really stuck with me. Yeah, and the Chevelles are such a great part of the Aussie film legacy and it's so wonderful that NFSA has all of that available to people that want to get more educated about the, um, you know, the history of our great cinema, right? Precisely. It's all, all there in the archive. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I mean, that's a significance of the, of the archive. Yeah. So what films or musical stories do you find yourself going back to over and over again? They could be from anywhere, Australia, America. Well, I'm someone who has been very interested in film and the evolution of film language. You know, film is only about a century and a quarter old, old. in particular, people seeing feature-length length films. And it's a, it's a newly acquired acquired language for humankind and a kid can read a film before they can read any text in in whatever language they read so it's something really interesting uh, about how how uh, about that so i i find myself going back almost pre, to pre-sound movies particularly the movies of buster keaton who i who still i find extraordinary what they're able to achieve and, and guys like um, Harold Lloyd. Um, 
otherwise the contemporary filmmakers uh you know every t- every time i I have an opportunity. I always watch Godfather 2 for some reason. That's a film, like a classic bit of music. If you, every time you go into it, you get caught up in it. But there's so many films, too many, too many to mention, I think, Jim. <laughs> so what do you think the secret sauce is for the Australian uh, cinema success? I mean, we just really punch above our weight, don't we, around the world? Well, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I could put it down. I, I mean, there's no simple answer to any of these things, but but I would say there are two things, um, at least in the way I, I, I've I've been able to observe it and and, and and watch watch people emerge and do the great work. And the the first is uh, goes back to a kind of a relaxed discipline that Australians have. The it's part of the I think it's still part of the culture that we're non-hierarchical, at least not as hierarchical as um, as some other cultures, uh, perhaps let's say older cultures. Uh, we don't insist on our status. So it's a, it, 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 uh, the wor- working in creative industries tends to be very, very egalitarian. I've noticed it particularly in the Australian film crews. Uh, it's highly, incredibly disciplined, uh, but but at the same time, it's very relaxed, it, and it's the reason why actors all around the world have loved Australian cinematographers, for instance, because the set is run with without a lot of tension. But that's not to say it's any in any way loose. In fact, it's quite the opposite. To do something well, you have to be relaxed. So that that sort of that thing goes deep in our culture, I think. Um, and the other thing I would say is that Australia being a relatively small population, you're allowed to try many things. So you can explore not just one discipline, just like you're a singer and all you do is sing. You, you need to, you know, you, you, you can act, you can write, you can, it, you, you can do, you can do, a multiplicity of things, and that's always going to be very, very useful. You can't specialise, you have to be a generalist, and you're more likely to do that out of Australia than anywhere else. What a great answer. I hadn't thought about some of that. Um, So when you reflect on your career, what does ambition mean to you? And by that, you know, I mean if it's changed from what you thought your ambitions were in the beginning to now. Ambition is very tricky. I, 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 I would say that I'm ambitious about process, not about result. Uh, you, uh, uh, you can't predict results. All you can do is the job ahead of you as best as possible. Uh, the, 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 the results are, are basically... I'm not saying they're random, but I'm saying they're too they're too many influences. That yeah, they're out of your control, really. They're basically out of your control entirely. You can just do the work. You shouldn't be even attempting to do any of the kind of work uh, in any industry, let alone uh, something like making movies and television, unless you're really uh, deeply curious about every aspect of, of the process. And you have to be hungry to learn and most importantly, to con- continue learning. I suppose you could say that about life. But I'd say if it, my, my, my biggest ambition is to understand how to tell stories with moving image um, uh, as well as possible. And that's probably, you know, I know you can be doing it for a thousand years and never really fully understand it, but at least you've got to try. Right. Well, talking about that curiosity, and you probably have already done almost all of these jobs, but is there another element of the filmmaking craft that if you weren't this kind of storyteller, you would be doing in another life? Well, look, it's really interesting because you you start off, you start off having one sort of, let's say, bias. I mean, I came to film mainly, mainly, because I used to uh, 
a drawer and paint a lot. Uh, so I started off being really, really interested in the pure, purely the visual. And then as time went on, I realized I'm being kind of foolish here because I have to understand every dimension of filmmaking. And so I become way more interested in sound and music, for instance, than I was when I first started off. So that, and then I realized, wait a moment, everything is part of your purview. So you really need to, 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 to look at everything. I, I didn't understand acting much when I started. Uh, actors were, were tended to be exotic creatures to me. And now I've really made it my job to try to understand what, what that process is and what the purpose of the process is. Um, and so on and so on. If, if I had to sort of say the thing that I'm, the area that I continue to be fascinated in is, and is, is the idea that uh, it is, is not only how to tell stories, but why we tell each other stories, why we're basically hardwired as humankind to tell each other stories. I think we make meaning through stories. And that's a big, that's a, that's a really big study uh, to, to, under, to understand. It's one of the privileges of working in movies is that you get to think about that process. You get, you get, you get to make a story with, with a whole bunch of different disciplines, and then you put it out there and, and the audiences tell you uh, what, 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 what's there. It, it, yeah. It's in the eye of the beholder, ultimately. And that's something you can't predict, but it's always a, a fascinating thing. Uh, how, what it, if it has any traction at all, what does it mean to people? What do they take for, from it? And, um, and for how long you know, does it stick with them? I think that's the thing I'm most interested in. Mm. So what does the NFSA mean to you personally as a history buff of film and, and in the business? Uh, well, for me personally, it's really good to know that the work, uh, so much of the work that we've done and, and with the people I've collaborated with uh, it is preserved there. But most importantly, that, that things... Look, the, the best way to answer it is it, uh, at the turn of the millennium back now, uh, uh, two decades ago, the BFI, the British in, in, uh, Film Institute, commissioned a number of directors around the world to, to, to make films about their own uh, cinema, um, American cinema. And, uh, and, and that, 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 uh, you know, that was very, I felt very, uh, very privileged to be doing to do it on Australian cinema, and we we went back with Graham Shirley, uh, who's a, a great film his, historian and filmmaker himself, and we went back to the National Archive to put together movies, uh, a, a basic a narrative of Australian cinema going back to the first feature Ned Kelly all the way through to. This, from the silent era to the sound era into the renaissance so-called in the 70s right through until I, until the year 2000 basically and and all of that was available in the in, in national film and sound archive and 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 uh, had it not been there because so much was lost as you know you know celluloid you, you must know this but celluloid was 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 flammable, and so much just co spontaneously com combusted, really, and there was a lot lost. But then it was the National Archive that actually was able to retrieve that, and so on and so on, all the way yeah. all the way through. Right. So that just just on that alone, it was significant. Here's here's the thing: one of the when I first went to America, I and got to meet the American filmmakers. This was back in the 80s. I was, I was astonished to the, uh, to, to the, about their, their, their 
encyclopedic knowledge of cinema. I mean, they all of those great filmmakers were, were like, they had profound knowledge of cinema. And we didn't have it in Australia. Uh, we basically saw anything outside of the mainstream in the film festival. So the Sydney, Melbourne, the film festivals were very, very significant in kind of fueling the, the, the filmmakers of, of the 70s and 80s and, and right through to the 90s. Mm. Uh, and, and because the American filmmakers and indeed the French and the British, let's say, had cinema texts, they could go uh, and watch uh, movies that were that regularly. Like someone could go and watch, if you're making a Western, you could go and watch every John Ford Western and that would influence your, 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 your filmmaking. We didn't have any of that. And I think, um, I think nowadays it's completely changed that you can find anything now um, you know, on the net, digitally streaming and whatever. But in those days, it was very, very significant. And we kind of, the, the only advantage is that we were a little naive in our techniques, so we had to find our own way of doing things. And in that way, um, you, you know, you might do something fresh. But, but anyway, that was, that, that was another really big thing that, that, yeah. that we had that heritage preserved. And, and the NFSA is obviously working on the upcoming exhibition, Australians and Hollywood, which I believe you've got um, a role in. And I wonder if you could tell us um, anything that you've contributed that people can look out for, or also why you believe it is important to celebrate the way they preserve and inspire future generations with an exhibition like this. Well, we've given, uh, we, 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 there are a few things. For, for instance, um, there are, uh, believe it or not, a whole bunch of props from The Last Mad Max, Fury Road, in particular steering wheels. Um, people really like the steering wheels because they were, you know, within the story, the steering wheels just weren't functional. They were almost semi-religious um, artefacts. I mean, if you see at the beginning, oh, I remember. The movie, yeah. there was a, a shrine of steering wheels and they hold them up. So those steering wheels are there. Um, and, um, and, I, I, and I think, Jenny, the, you know, the, the most important things are, 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 are because of what we've said. Um, yeah. It's a celebration. It's a reminder. It's a res of what, what happened in the past. It was a resource. It's really, really important. I mean, the, the foresight of the politicians who decided we needed it, but, you know, it has to be recognised, and and the work that they've done over these decades is really really significant. You know, the thing about cinema too, it's the one cultural artefact that is as young as this country. Everything else, uh, I mean. We, we, we were federated at the turn of the 20th century, around about the time cinema started. Everything else, theatre, opera, yeah. music, uh, art, everything went, went back in other cultures. You, you could go back to the earliest recorded history uh, um, one way or another. But it's the only one that's as young as our country. And I think that's why Australians particularly took, took to it. And... and we, and, the only, and the other thing is we've also got um, the, the, uh, the oldest existing culture of humankind in the First Nations people. That's a pretty, pretty special thing. It's unique to this country, but they carried in them all their narratives in people call them song lines or whatever, but they carried in them in their oral tradition and in, in their work and their art and in their very being. It was just part of who they were. So here we have cultures that, um, that uh, already a culture that is, is I, I guess, uh, it, it, it's multi-level storytelling. It's, yeah. it's expressed um, in, in song, dance, word, uh, um, uh, it, 
you know, art. It's all, and it's all telling a story. And it's not just, they're not just entertainments. They have to be engaging in order for them to be remembered. Uh, that they have to be compelling in order for that to be. But, but they are also a way of mapping the landscape. They're the equivalent of our modern G GPS. Uh, they're, 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 they tell you how to survive, they uh, you know, where you might find particular resources, water, and, and, and so on. And they also tell you, and they also tell you um, how the world came to be. And, 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 and humans, uh, humans um, place in it. So that all that is a, a significant thing, I think. Um, so needless to say, you can uh, you, you can tell that uh, uh, that I'm really interested in 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 the deep past of, of Australian culture all the way through in, into cinema. Into cinema, and that's why I'm, I, that's why I, I think I'm I'm still doing it. I, I, I'm just have that, I, I, I suppose it's the curiosity more than anything else. Mm. Well, I think in a hundred years, there'll be probably other filmmakers sitting here talking about your influence on them. You came out at an extraordinary time in the seventies and have remained, you know, one of our great beloved filmmakers, um, you know, telling stories, not just for Australians, but for the world. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about what that was like at that time and if you had any help from, I guess there were some Australians that were ahead of you, but I don't know what that oh, was yeah. like. Now everybody helps everybody, you know. Which is, which is the thing I was talking about before, about the, the Australian, I don't know, uh, collegial ma ma mateship, mateship. mateship. I, 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 I think that's significant. I'm sure it's in other places. But but but, and I think it comes out of the uh, out of the the European history of Australia. There has to be, uh, it, 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 you know, that it was it was mainly people. Uh, you know, there was mining. There were convicts. There were, and, and by the time the World Wars came, um, these great massive global shifts. Uh, that Australian that Australian, for the want of a better word, egalitarian quality really was incredibly helpful uh, during that period. And I think that went into, 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 film, into film crews. But so, of course, there was a lot of, there were, there were filmmakers cooperatives where people had, there's no, there wasn't much thought to career. There was no, no thought, it was just, People really wanted to make films. So the filmmakers cooperatives that one started in Melbourne came up to Sydney. A lot of the filmmakers who started to make features made their first shorts there. They would be shown there, basically, in, in, in some sort of dingy place in, in Darlinghurst or in Carlton. And, uh, and, you'd, and that's where you'd meet, meet like-minded people and, 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 and talk to them and, and share ideas and sometimes you work on each other's films. But it's really interesting, a very significant figure in, 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 was Ken Hall, again, a, a filmmaking pioneer. And I remember he, he was getting into his 80s and 90s and he was, whenever an Australian in that period would make a film, he'd write them a letter, just an encouraging letter and say, I saw your film, and, 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 and so on. And he was very important because we, we, ended, up doing a, we ended up doing an interview. When, when I say we, there was Graham Shirley, Philip Noyce, and myself. And we interviewed him for, this was when he was in his 90s, interviewed him for two days. And, um, and because we suddenly realised that he was someone who started off in silent cinema. He made silent movies. He made Australia's first sound movie on our selection, the first time that Australians heard the Australian bush in, in, in the cinema. He then made the, he made some of the first comedies. He was very influential just behind the scenes 
just encouraging filmmakers. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the last question, um, I guess when you um, were coming up, uh, going to Hollywood was not even really a thing for filmmakers or actors as much. And now, of course, people sort of almost consider it like you're not, you haven't made it unless you've, you know, crossed over. But now people are coming back. <laughs> so I yeah. wonder if you could talk a little bit about your advice to uh, Aussie storytellers who are dreaming of making it in Hollywood and what you'd say to them now? Well, now, now I, I, I would say um, Hollywood is the whole world. It, you don't have to be based in Hollywood. I honestly believe that. I mean, we've, we, we, we've just been making, you know, the, the two films I'm working on at the moment because of COVID haven't left, basically haven't left home. I mean, we, of course, we've gone on, onto sets where there have been uh, rigorous protocols and so on. But before this, if I was dealing with... Uh, with it, it started before COVID, but, but less and less you would need to fly to Hollywood. Um, you, can do, you can do... Most of casting is done now uh, because of necessity over... Uh, just as we're talking now... So Hollywood is everywhere, really. Um, if you look at this, if you look at where most big movies are made, uh, they, they're not necessarily made in, in Hollywood. That's so that's a, uh, so that, that's the first thing, and and and, and the second thing is, uh, I, I you know I I remember I grew up in a time when people would say, oh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, I think it's reversed. I think it's what you know much more is much more important than who you know. Because if you know something and you can and you and and, and you're rigorous about it and you have skills uh, in whatever yeah. field that you're talking about, um, and you have skills and you're and you see that you're bringing something unique, um, uh, that's probably the most thing. So. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, when I get asked that question a lot, it's, it's learn as much as you can, put it into action in some way and offer it out there. And, and the world will pretty, pretty soon tell you whether uh, it's, it's got any worth or not. And, yeah. and that's, that's, how it all, that's how it's always been, really. That's true. It's a quite, it's a very egalitarian world now. You could make a short film from the middle of the bush and if people find it and love it, you know, it doesn't matter where you were, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been such a treat talking to you and thank you everybody for watching and stay tuned for the next episode of NFSA Presents Inspired. Hey, thanks, Jenny.